Hello everyone, welcome back to the Genomics Bootcamp and our introduction to genomics lecture series. Today we will speak about genomic inbreeding and even more precisely the runs of homozygosity. As always, we start with a quick summary of the previous stuff we were talking about during these lectures, which will help us down the line within these presentations. So, as always, we continue to speak about single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNP markers, which are distributed fairly evenly throughout the genome. These SNPs are biallelic, which means that there are two alleles at each locus, and these alleles can come together in, well, three forms. That is the homozygous AA and the other homozygous BB, and then there could be heterozygous genotypes. Also in this case, the inheritance from parent to offspring will play a huge role and therefore it is needed to refresh that the inheritance is not going on on a whole chromosome basis, but there are the so-called recombination events that chop up the chromosomes and a reshuffled and remixed version of the parental chromosomes is inherited down the line to the offspring. In this presentation, we will talk about inbreeding, so it is really good to define what it is. So inbreeding is a consequence of mating of related individuals. Well, two individuals are related if they have a common ancestor. There could be one or more such common ancestors, and these could be found and identified by a conventional pedigree records that are just a non-genomic written records about the parentage of each individual. Now, this is one option, but of course, we can use genomic marker data as well to pinpoint these common ancestors. Inbreeding as such is a huge topic, especially if you're interested in the genetics of diversity. And there is a lot and lot of literature and also various aspects that could be used and discussed when it comes to inbreeding. In this presentation, we will focus only on the genomic aspect of it. Even more precisely, we will focus on the so-called runs of homozygosities. Also, there are other methods how to determine inbreeding coefficient, also based on genomic data. And if you're interested in this, let me know in the comments below and I might revisit this topic. Inbreeding as such is the probability that alleles within an individual are identical by descent. So this is a more proper definition of the term. But there is a new expression here. So what identical by descent means. So identity by descent or IBD in short is when two or more alleles are identical copies of the same ancestral allele in the base population. IBD can be estimated for alleles at single loci in a diploid individual or between individuals as we will see in the follow-up slide for a short graphical representation. Now there is also a similar term, which is identity by state or IBS in short. This refers to two or more alleles that look the same or basically they have the same state, but they are not IBD. So they are not copies of, a, of an ancestral allele, but they just happen to be the same allele on the same locus. For example, if two individuals both carry a T allele at a specific locus, as you will see in the next slide. So here is the promised graphical representation of IBD versus IBS. I took this one from Powell et al. 2010. So here is the citation if you want to check this paper out in more detail. For our purpose, this is enough here. So basically, I just wanted to show again also on the graphic representation what IBD versus IBS means. The first note here that we need to take into consideration is the base population, which is this line here with the individuals B1, B2, B3, and B4. So this is the population that we are looking at as our basis. Before this, well, obviously there were other individuals as well, but we don't know about them. And this is the baseline which we use for our comparison for the alleles. Even before this base population, but there was an ancestor, well, let's say the ancestor allele was a G here, but there was some kind of a mutation. So there is some kind of a variation within this population. So there at a certain locus, there's a G and a T allele. 
So we have our current population here with the individuals C1 to C5. Here you see that in the individual C1, 2, and 3, this G allele is the exact copy of the G allele from B1. So these three are identical by descent. So this G, this G, and this G is IBD. On the other hand, there are these T alleles here in the C4 and C5, but you see that these are not exact copies from the same individual at the base population. So that's why these, although they look the same, they are not IBD, but identical by state or IBS. So why is this relevant? Well, in the inbreeding calculations, we are actually looking at the alleles that well, look the same and well, they are in a homozygous state, but we are interested in the alleles that are IBD, which are exact copies of the ancestral alleles or well, better said, ancestral segments. Before we dive more into the genomic background of the inbreeding, I wanted to tell a few words about consequences of inbreeding. Again, there is a lot of literature about this, so this is just a really quick summary. So the inbreeding causes reduced genetic diversity. So it is increase in homozygosity and decline in heterozygosity by definition. And this actually lowers the possibilities of future adaptation. So here, the decline in heterozygosity is the main issue. Also, there are increased possibilities for inherited disorders to manifest. For example, if these disorders would be recessive alleles, then these recessive alleles in a heterozygous state doesn't cause any harm. But if there is an increased homozygosity in a population, then there is an increased chance that these recessive alleles come into a homozygous state and therefore can manifest in the population. And the third thing, which is often mentioned with connection to inbreeding, is that is the so-called inbreeding depression. So this is basically a reduction in quantitative traits let's say production levels, reproduction levels, or fitness traits. So the more inbred individuals are within a population, the more inbreeding depression we could observe, which is then unfavorable for the production or fitness levels. When we talk about inbreeding, we actually want to determine the inbreeding coefficient of the individual. And this is denoted as the capital F. So the F is basically the inbreeding coefficient. It takes values between zero and one or zero and 100%, if you will. In the representation we will be speaking about right now, because also there are a bunch of inbreeding coefficients and also different scales, but let's simplify for this particular presentation, we will be talking about an inbreeding coefficient, which if takes a value of zero, then this individual is not inbred. And if takes a, and if it takes a value of one or 100%, this individual would, would be fully inbred. So there would be absolutely no genetic variation within this genome and all the nucleotides within the genome would be 100% homozygous. Now in the real populations, we don't see a zero and we certainly don't see a one or a hundred percent. And well, we see something in between. When we want to quantify inbreeding, so we could use the pedigree data. As I mentioned, these are the classical written records about the parents of the individual and the parents also have their parents denoted somewhere. And the, this grandparental generation has the grand grandparental generation written down. And so we, with this book, we can actually find the identities of each parent and we could put together the inbreeding coefficient based on pedigree data. Now we can encounter a problem here, of course, because these records either with a classical written form in a book or written form in a digital copies in a data set or a database might or might not exist. Also, if they exist, they might be of different depth, meaning that depending on when this data started to be recorded. So we might have a relatively few generations available for these written records. And also whatever was written, there might be that there was some kind of an error. So might be that some of these records are also incorrect. 
which of course then leads to incorrect computation of the pedigree inbreeding coefficient. Depending on the start of this recording, the pedigree inbreeding coefficient mostly identified. Recent inbreeding for the individuals, and also here we have a, a strong assumption that the founders are assumed to be unrelated. On the other hand, the genomic data or the genomic inbreeding coefficient allows us to identify the actual proportion of the genome that was inherited from a common ancestor. So here we don't do any assumptions, but we actually observed the segments that are identical by descent, and we can sum them up to a genomic inbreeding coefficient, as you will see in the following slides. Now, I mentioned that there are different ways how to compute inbreeding coefficient based on the genomic data, but this presentation will focus on the so-called runs of homozygosities. So as the name suggests, the runs of homozygosities or ROH in short, are regions of the genome, which are actually the copies inherited from the parents. And these regions of the genome are actually identical by descent. And these whole stretches of the genome, which could be of various lengths, are identical and therefore represented in a range or basically a series of homozygous nucleotides. Well, these are identical because the parents have inherited them from a common ancestor at some point in the past. And we are not talking about, well, one nucleotide or two nucleotides or something like that, but we are talking about stretches of the genome, which are in length of tens of thousands up to millions or tens of millions of nucleotides. So we are talking about really, really long segments of the genome. Now I mentioned that in real populations, you hardly find any two individuals that would be totally unrelated, so with the genomic inbreeding coefficient of zero. And that's because if we go back far enough in time, we can find common ancestors for virtually all individuals. And which is a nice thing, the genomic data allows us to do so and allows us to explore common ancestors far, far back on the timeline. We don't necessarily want to do that all the time, but it is a possibility. Now, here is a neat example that I tell all the time to my students. So, well, the picture is a bit dated. Well, you see here that 2011 is the current date, but actually it doesn't really matter because it holds through nevertheless. So basically, this is a family tree. And let's say that you are on the top. Well, you have, as everybody else, two parents, four grandparents, eight grand-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, and so on. So basically, with each subsequent generations, the number of individuals doubles. So quite quickly, we get into really large numbers. So what is the point here? So this is an example from the global human population, which is fairly unrelated. Still, if you go back well, not even that long, for example, to 1400s, you should have at least 1 billion people in that generation. Now, the only minor problem is that the world population at that time was not even half a billion. So that means that actually many of these individuals within this great, 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 great grandparental generation were not unique. And this actually means that on average, all of us are related to everybody else twice. Also, of course, if your parents happen to be coming from the same country or, for example, the same town, village, location, region, then, of course, this relatedness on a global scale is even higher, which is just to demonstrate that all of us carry these segments of the genome that are identical by descent because they come from a common ancestor. And of course, studying runs of homozygosities on a human population is a great thing. But if you don't want to go back hundreds of years, you can study the same thing in livestock or companion animals where we have mating of related individuals on a daily basis. Here is a short pedigree of a half sib mating, which is not that uncommon in livestock or in cattle breeding. This is also an example to calculate the 
pedigree inbreeding coefficient based on probabilities. Let me introduce this scheme a little bit. So here we have a bull which had two offspring, let's say, for this particular example, said there was a son and a daughter, and the son and daughter, well, from different mothers, but so they, these two are half sips. And these were mated and, well, producing an individual here. Now the question is, what is the inbreeding coefficient of this individual? And as I mentioned, one of the ways how to do this is based on pedigree data. Here we have a certain locus and there we have an A1 and A2 here. So basically the question is, what is the probability that these genotypes is A1, A1? So basically that the A1 allele comes down this way here and at the same time this way on the side of the mother here, or the A2 allele comes down on this side from the father side and also this side from the mother side to this individual also producing a homozygous A2, A2. Now again, this is, well, there is a lot of things to unpack here, but I give you just a short version. Well, based on the Mendelian rules, so there is always a 50% chance that some allele is getting inherited down the line. And uh, we can actually calculate this based on this particular pedigree. The inbreeding coefficient of this individual is uh, 0 0.5 to the power of three. That is 0 0.125 or 12 and a half percent. So in other words, 12 and a half percent of the genome of this individual is identical by descent. This was computed based on probabilities and well, assuming each time the coefficient of 0 0.5. This does not consider anything genomic, and also it does not consider anything about the known patterns of inheritance, especially what we know about is that there are recombination events acting on each chromosome. Now, this short example wants to introduce, well, a scenario which is more close to the reality based on genomic data. So you see that we have exactly the same scenario here. And we have also the genotypes of each individual. Now, for a moment, let's pretend that these 12 nucleotides here are the entire genome of this individual. So you see here that there are the two haplotypes here, the maternal and paternal haplotypes, which are then getting inherited on the paternal side, so to the son and to the daughter of this bull, which then come together in some way in their offspring. If we track it, so you see that there is the CGG here, which then gets passed down to the son and also to the daughter, and they come together in a homozygous form at the genome of this offspring. So there is a CGG, CGG here, which is then a small run of homozygosity. Now, as I mentioned, there was a, well, fairly large assumption that this is the whole genome of the individual. So this 12 nucleotides is the whole genome. So this segment of three nucleotides here would be a one quarter of the genome being in a run of homozygosity. So this would be then 0.25 or 25%. We ended up with this segment being in a run of homozygosity because there were some recombination even that were chopping up and mixing together the various haplotypes. And we ended up basically with this small run of homozygosity here. Now for this small example, the previously the pedigree inbreeding coefficient was 12 and percent. Well, this is now different. This also shows actually the reality that, well, the pedigree and the genomic inbreeding coefficient could be different. But while the pedigree inbreeding coefficient was based on probabilities, the genomic inbreeding coefficient is based on the actual observations from the genome. Also, I want to highlight here that to get this genomic inbreeding coefficient, we actually don't need any kind of additional support data. We are, and we are not relying on the precision on the and the accuracy of such supporting information. For example, the pedigree data, what we need is only 
the genotype data from these individuals, or actually not even from all of them, but just this last individual. So we need the genotypes of the current population, and we could actually compute the genomic inbreeding coefficient for these individuals without even knowing anything from the previous generations. Well, this is another representation of a similar scenario. So here you see, well, this part of the picture is pretty similar as before. So this is also half sib mating. You see it here is this bull and here is our individual here. And what we see is the haplotypes that are kind of mixed together in uh, various ways due to recombination. And some of these segments or parts of this ancestral haplotypes come together in a homozygous form in this individual. This does not need to be so easy or so straightforward in a way that there is only one common ancestor, but of course there could be many common ancestors all around and the final genomic inbreeding coefficient for each individual is actually the sum of these segments from all the common ancestors. So in this case, well, there is just still this one common ancestor, but of course there could be many more coming together and basically what we could see or are and identify are these various segments that consist of entirely homozygous nucleotides, which then means that these are most likely if they are long enough and if they satisfy certain criteria, so that these segments are really segments that are identical by descent and therefore contribute to the genomic inbreeding coefficient of that individual. The calculation of genomic inbreeding coefficient is, well, fairly easy, and this is done really with this small equation here. The F rho is basically the genomic inbreeding coefficient. Well, F, as I mentioned, is the inbreeding coefficient, and the ROH is just to indicate that it's calculated based on the ROH segments. And what we do is we identify all the genomic segments or all the segments that are ROH in a certain individual, and we sum them up, and we just divide it by the length of the genome or length of the autosome covered by SNPs. So again, in other words, the genomic inbreeding coefficient is the proportion of the genome covered by ROH segments, so those which are homozygous due to identity by descent. So this is really the proportion of the IBD segments from the total genome. Now the length of these segments would be different, and this is really based on the position of the common ancestor. Let's say we have this individual here, and if there were relatively few generations from this individual to the common ancestors, the ROH segments are relatively long. And the reason is because, well, the recombination did not have the really time and opportunity to chop down these segments to smaller parts. So on average, what we see is relatively long ROH segments in case when the common ancestor is relatively recent. On the other hand, we could see also many more smaller ROH segments as well. For example, for this individual, and this is most often the case, or the case when the common ancestor was really far back in the pedigree or well, far back in the past, and there were many generations between this individual and the common ancestor. So they were recombination events at all each of these steps, which then resulted into a situation that only small or relatively short segments come together as ROH. Well, when I mention small, I, it could be still millions of nucleotides long. So it's not that we are talking about 10 or 20 uh, nucleotides, but they are definitely shorter compared to this situation when the common ancestor was just a few generations back in the pedigree. As I mentioned, the ROH segment size points towards the elapsed time interval in generations between the individuals and the common ancestor. The longer the detected ROH, the shorter the time interval to the common ancestor. And the reason, as I mentioned, are the generally lower number of recombination events.
where we could also time these things. And then if we look at runs of homozygosities that are about one megabase long, so these are still one million base pair longs. The common ancestor was about 50 generations back from the individual. And if we look at long runs of homozygosities, for example, around 16 megabases, that is 16 million bases, the common ancestor was about three generations back. Of course, depending on the RH segment, we can then time the common ancestors and we can ask or answer different research questions. But just I wanted to give these two values so, so you have at least some idea what lengths of segments and what numbers of generations we speak about. If you have seen my video in this series about selection signatures, you might be familiar with this slide. Well, this is just a repetition, but in this case also, because these are the so-called run of homozygosity islands or ROH islands. Now here, each line is an individual here, and you see it for each line, there is a fair number of these small stretches. So this is a run of homozygosity for each individual. So you see that there is a bunch of them fairly randomly scattered throughout the genomes. They, some of them are really small ones. There could be also some longer ones. But sometimes in some places of the genome, it happens that the entire population tends to have a run of homozygosity more or less at the same segment, or actually not even more or less, but in the exactly same segment of the genome is homozygous. And this could be a selection signature uh, because, well, it could be that there is some important gene in the region that is very beneficial for that population, and therefore it actually gets somehow conserved in this state, which by definition means that this segment is being kept in, a, in the same form, or this haplotype is very widespread in the population, creating these runs of homozygosities. And when this run of homozygosities in the exactly same location of the genome are showing up, we see such ROH islands as we see here, for example, or also here. So there are parts of the genome that you see that they are really, really the same for the entire population. Another interesting way how to use runs of homozygosities is related to the recessive disorders, as I mentioned. So this is from a older paper, Charlie et al. 2008, but it demonstrates really nicely how can we use also runs of homozygosities in tracking down inherited disorders or especially uh, the so-called Mendelian disorders. Now, these are the ones that I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation that, well, there are some disorders that are influenced by recessive alleles. So if they are in heterozygous state, well, nothing happens. But if these two recessive alleles come together, then they cause a disorder. Now, because of this uh, and, and how the generally the genomic segments are being inherited in the populations, then these recessive alleles are by definition in a run of homozygosity. Also because the linkage disequilibrium is acting and well, as we mentioned multiple times within this lecture series, that the nucleotides on the genome are not being inherited independently from each other, but in segments of various lengths that are held together by the linkage disequilibrium. Now, what we have here, or actually on this picture as well, is the, the following. So now we know that there is a recessive disorder in a population that manifests in a normally in some very unpleasant way. What we can do is genotype individuals. We genotype the cases. So these are the individuals that have the disorder. And we also genotype some other individuals from the same population, which are the so-called controls, when we are sure that these individuals are free of such disorder. Now, as I mentioned before, the, these recessive disorders must be, by definition, well, if they are Mendelian disorders, they must be 
in a run of homozygosity. So if we just really compare the genomes of controls and cases, the causal variance in the cases must be in a place where all of the cases are in a run of homozygosity. So here are, you see that they, these are in this, with this darker color, and we, you see that there is a part here that overlaps for all cases. And at the same time, these regions are not in a run of homozygosity, or at least not homozygous for all the controls. So if you contrast these two, you can actually pinpoint the regions that are causing this particular disorder, as it was also described for this particular cattle population. So this is also a really neat way how to utilize the run of homozygosities. So we are already at the summary for this presentation for the runs of homozygosities. So we talked about inbreeding in general. So if the two parents are related through a one or more common ancestors, the offspring will be inbred. So this inbreeding could be expressed also well, various ways, but we talked about the so-called run of homozygosities that are expressed via these homozygous segments that are of various lengths. The longer these ROH segments, the closer the common ancestor was in the pedigree. So basically, if we see very long ROH segments, then it was perhaps a few generations back, uh, this common ancestor in the pedigree. And if we see some shorter segments, then these come probably from a common ancestor that is further back in the pedigree. Well, these run of homozygosities or ROH segments could be utilized various ways. The most obvious one and the, or the most frequently used is to calculate the genomic inbreeding coefficient, but also it could be used to identify selection signatures with the so-called ROH islands or even trying to find some Mendelian recessive disorders as we have shown in the previous slide. So this was everything for today. If you like this presentation and this series, be sure to leave a like, leave a comment if you have any questions or just want to say hi. And also, well, in general, if you have any comment towards the videos on this channel. But for now, I thank you for your time and have a very nice day.